The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a woman calling an animal park to inquire about a job. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Pinder's Animal Park, hello. Oh, hello. I'm ringing to ask whether you have any jobs available. Ah, what sort of work are you looking for? Is that permanent or part-time or...? Actually, I'm just looking for temporary work. I'm a student. Oh, right. Uh, I'll just get a form and ask you a few questions. Then I'll pass your application on to our recruitment section. Is that OK? Fine, thank you. So, starting with your name. It's Jane Lamerton. Is that L A? Double M E R T O N? There's only one M in it. Oh, right. And your address? It's 42 West Lane. Right. And is that in Exeter? Yes. OK. And can you give me your mobile phone number? 07792 Right. Now, the next thing is, when are you available to start work? I finish college on the 8th of June. That's in three weeks' time. But I can't start work till the 11th because I've got a hospital appointment on the 10th of June. Ah, no problem. Now, I need to ask you a few questions about the type of job that might be suitable. Do you have any particular kind of work in mind? It doesn't necessarily mean that you will get work in the field that you want, but I can record your preferences. Well, I'd do anything, and I have worked as an assistant animal keeper before, when I was still at school, but I'm studying at a catering college now, and I'd really like to get some experience as an assistant cook, if possible. Right. So that's your first choice. Have you done that kind of job before? No, but I've helped my aunt sometimes. She runs a cafe in Exeter. Hmm. Would you say you've got any relevant skills, then? Well, I'm used to using the kind of equipment you usually find in a kitchen. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK. And I know you're still studying, but do you already have any qualifications related to that kind of work? A hygiene qualification, for example? I haven't, no. But I've got a certificate in food handling. I did it before I decided to become a full-time student. Fine. OK. That means you wouldn't need any specific training if you did get the kind of work you wanted. But you'd have to do a short course on first aid. All our new employees do that. It just takes half a day, and most people find it generally useful. Oh, yes, I'm sure it is. Well, uh, that's about it, really. Oh, uh, just one last thing. Can you give me the name of someone who would give you a reference, like a previous employer or... Oh, yes. You can put Dr Ruth Price. OK. Is that one of your college lecturers? She's my college tutor. She's known me for over two years, and I'm sure she wouldn't mind. 
In fact, she's given me a reference before. Fine. We'd probably contact her by phone. Do you happen to know her number? I've got it on my phone, yes. It's 0208 685 114. That's a landline. Good. Well, as I say, I can't promise anything, but I'll pass your application on and you should hear in a few days. Is there anything else? Just one thing. I suffer from a particular type of colour blindness, and sometimes employers have to make special arrangements for that. OK. I'll make a note of that. It won't be a good that you've made us aware of it. You can provide us with more details if you're offered a job. OK. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two engineering students, a woman in her sixth year called Linda and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did, yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself. And you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team. And we had an individual task, too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full-time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed? Yes. But I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. And then, at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? Well, no. I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day. 
and so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things, like organizational ability, initiative, that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year. Depending on my exam results, of course, but still. A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one. So my general skills improved, like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but... While you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I am about to make a start on the engineering materials module and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally. But this book is very accessible, so it suited me. It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials Engineering? Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new edition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really helped to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there, Engineering Basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Maria is a student at university. She has handed the first draft of an essay to her tutor. The tutor has read it, and now they are discussing ways the essay can be improved. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, Maria, I have to say I was quite impressed by your essay. <laughs> it's a big improvement on the last one. Really? I'm glad. I put a lot more work into this one. I really spent ages on it. Mm. And it shows. You've addressed most of the problems I pointed out last time. 
In particular, the style and language are much more appropriate for an academic essay. So that aspect is okay. Absolutely. If you carry on like this, you shouldn't have any significant problems in that department. That's a relief. I've been quite worried about that. Although I've been reading a lot of other essays to try to get the right style. Well, I'd say you've been successful. There are just one or two minor things you could look at. Uh, your punctuation's quite basic. It's really just full stops and commas and parentheses. Brackets? Y yes, brackets if you prefer. In academic writing, these are best used only occasionally, if at all. You use them rather too often. OK, I see. And uh, I'm sorry to mention it, but you're spelling. I know, I know. But I'm working on a foreign computer. The spell checker doesn't work for English. Are you sure? Have you tried changing the setting to English? No, I haven't. Well, I should see if that's possible. I haven't marked you down this time, but, well, some of my colleagues are a bit old-fashioned about spelling. I'd try to get that sorted out if I were you. OK, I understand. I'll try to change the setting. Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The only major problem I have with the content of your essay is the introduction. Oh. The introduction should, well, introduce the theme of the essay. Mm. You've put some of the most important points there. <laughs> For example, this bit. Um, yeah, the statistics about the growth of railways in the 1850s. That really should go in the main body of the essay. Yeah. And so should this paragraph about changes in patterns of employment. In general, I'd say your introductory section should be no more than half as long as it is at the moment. Mm, OK. And I should move those points forward? Precisely. And going back to the railways, they're one of the most significant factors for change in this period. Mm. But apart from those statistics in the introduction, you only briefly mention them. Ah. I'd like to see a lot more on that. And the influence the expansion of the railways had on patterns of social and economic behaviour. You mean how with the railways people could travel to find work and could meet people from other areas? E exactly. Then in the midsection, well, it's not a big thing, but this quotation from the Times. You think it's too long? <sighs> Well, you said it. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of a way to shorten it. Do you think it's really necessary? You mean I could just get rid of it? Yes. You've already made the point and backed it up with other evidence. The quotation's redundant, really. OK. Well, that'll be easy. There were various other minor points, uh, which I've noted in the margins. Mm. You can look at those later. But moving forward to the end here... <sighs> I wasn't quite sure what this meant. The final paragraph? Yes. Are you saying that, on the whole, the changes of the mid-19th century tended to improve the lives of ordinary people or not? It's not very clear. Mm, it's not? No, it isn't. I'd add a few lines clarifying your position. OK. When do you want the final draft? No, uh, the end of term will be fine. Um, but there was just one other thing, the bibliography. Did you really read all these books? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> just the books you actually consulted will be fine. You don't need to include everything ever published on the subject. <laughs> right, OK. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on research in the Indian Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In this, the first lecture in our series on the changing face of the oceans of the world, we are going to look at the Indian Ocean, into which the Oceanography Department at the Institute here in Australia has been doing pioneering research over the past five years. Let us start with some facts about the Indian Ocean. To give you an idea of the scope and complexity of the enterprise we have undertaken, as you can see from the diagrams here on the screen, showing the relative size of the planet's five oceans, the Indian Ocean comes third after the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, but is larger than the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. On this slide. You can see that the Indian Ocean is different from the two larger oceans, in that it is landlocked to the north, and does not extend into the cold regions of the North Pole, covering some seventy-three million four hundred and forty thousand square kilometers. The ocean constitutes approximately one seventh of the Earth's surface, and about twenty percent of the world's total ocean area. At the equator. It is around six thousand four hundred kilometers wide, with the average depth being about three thousand four hundred meters, and with the deepest point being the Java Trench at seven thousand four hundred and fifty meters. Flowing into the Indian Ocean, we have some of the world's greatest rivers: the Zambezi here, the Ganges here. The Indus, the Brahmaputra, and the Tigris-Euphrates just here. The two largest islands in the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, here off the coast of Africa, and Sri Lanka, here off the southern tip of India, are structurally parts of the continents of Africa and Asia, while islands like the Seychelles. Are exposed tops of submerged ridges. The Maldives are low coral islands, and Mauritius and Reunion are volcanic cones. The surface waters of the ocean are warm, except where the ocean touches the cold waters to the south. A network of scientists, mainly oceanographers and meteorologists from around the world. Are monitoring changes in the ocean's temperature and acidity, especially where it meets the Southern Ocean, in order to see how global warming is having an effect on the waters there. An assessment is also being carried out on how this is impacting on low-lying habitats and peoples in the more populated coastal regions around the rim of the ocean, in the warmer north. Islands are vulnerable to even the subtlest changes in sea levels and tides, so they are being closely watched. Moreover, a close eye is being kept on wind changes, especially alterations to the monsoon rains, typhoons, cyclones, and any other natural phenomena. In addition to the information sent from the ship. That we have stationed off Antarctica, in the south of the Indian Ocean, data are being transmitted round the clock from buoys anchored at various points around the ocean. Five of these buoys are observing ice packs and icebergs coming into the Indian Ocean from Antarctica. Besides the buoys, data on cloud cover and wind and temperature change are received by satellite. 
Satellite images are also being used to record the size of the icebergs from the moment they break off from Antarctica. Their course is then mapped as they move out into the Southern Ocean. Here at the Institute, the raw data from the various sources are received and the information is then constantly processed by a bank of computers. Once the data have been collated, the next step in the process is the analysis by experts here and at centres around the world looking for even the slightest shift in patterns of temperature, wind and sea levels. In the light of the fact that this is a global enterprise, the Institute is staffed 24 hours a day with researchers working in shifts and we are in constant contact with centres all around the world. In total, 900 experts from around the globe are involved in the programme. The work at the Institute is now into the fifth year of a 10-year data collection, which began in 2003. The analysis of the five years to 2008 will be published early in 2009. However, changes in patterns are already being noticed since the data have been gathered. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.